the world through Hungary's eyes. There is hardly a day without a scandal surrounding Hungary and its long-standing leader, Viktor Orban. Most often, Hungary makes headlines due to scandals related to the actions or statements of Mr. Orban or the media under his control. In textbooks approved by the government, it is claimed that the war in Ukraine is an internal conflict. From television screens and newspaper pages, the average Hungarian learns that Ukraine is a weak and an artificially created country controlled by the United States. Orban himself calls on the world to stop the counteroffensive against Russia. Before the Ministry of Foreign Affairs could react to this disgraceful statement, a demarche need to be prepared due to a video aired on a government-controlled channel showing Ukraine without Crimea. Internationally, there is a discussion about a political blunder. Prime Minister Orban, during a protocol photo with Moldova's President Maya Sandu, attempted not to shake her hand, but to kiss her. The president pointed to designated spot for a photography, and a bewildered Orban couldn't hide his surprise and disappointment at his colleague's behavior. At the July NATO summit in Vilnius, Mr. Orban called for a cessation of arms supplies to Ukraine. He insists that Ukraine should engage in peaceful negotiations. In essence, that means that Ukraine should surrender and submit to the will of Russia. Why does the leader of Hungary boldly make such unpopular statements? Doesn't he know the protocol or deliberately disregard them? Why does he consciously choose behavior that is criticized in Europe and the United States? Is this why Hungary is perhaps the only country in the European Union that consistently and tirelessly supports Russia in this war? Is it Orban's personal sympathies? Or is there something deeper, more serious behind it? The impression arises that Hungary sees the world in its own way, understood solely by Hungarians. Let's try to look at the world through Hungary's eyes. Let's start from the beginning and be frank. Hungary has not been lucky. They repeatedly chosen the wrong alley. First Nazi Germany, then the Soviet Union, and now Russia. During the interwar period from 1918 to 1939, Hungary was in despair. Austria-Hungary no longer existed. A large part of its territories was lost, all against the backdrop of the global economic crisis. Therefore, it seemed right for Christian Hungary, which always leaned towards right-wing ideas, to support the young, promising politician Adolf Hitler. Hungarians hoped that, with his help, they could regain their territories and achieve economic stability. Miklos Horthy, regent of Hungary. At that time, the leader of the country was an experienced politician of noble origin, a descendant of military dynasty, the renowned Admiral Miklos Horthy. After the death of his father in 1920, Miklos Horthy was elected as a member of the Hungarian parliament, which declared Hungary of a monarchy on January 1st. Horthy was appointed regent with virtual unlimited power under King Karl. In March 1920, he became the head of the Hungarian kingdom. He established an authoritarian conservative regime in the country, which allied with the Nazi Germany. In the 1920s and 1930s, Horthy foreign policy aimed at closer ties with Italy and Germany. Under Horthy, Hungary enacted laws that restricted the rights of Jews. But overall, the Jewish community was protected from genocide. In the 1940s, Hungary became an ally of Nazi Germany. Horthy 
seeking to preserve the autonomy of his country, cooperated with the Nazi regime and provided support for their efforts on the Eastern Front. However, he also tried to find ways to exit the war. In 1944, when Nazi Germany was facing defeat, Horthy attempted to negotiate a separate peace with the anti-Hitler coalition. He hoped to protect Hungary from Soviet occupation and prevent the country's destruction. As Stalin forces approached Budapest, Horthy tried to make a separate peace agreement with the victorious coalition states, similar to what the leaders of Finland and Romania did. But these attempts were thwarted by Germans, and Horthy himself was removed from office. From October 16th, um, the year 1944, he was under house arrest in Berlin. To increase pressure on Horthy and prevent further negotiation with the Allies, the Nazi kidnapped his son and brought him to Germany. He was imprisoned in the Sachsenhausen concentration camp until the end of the World War II. Miklos Horthy himself didn't stand trial for crimes against humanity and fled from Hungary to Portugal in 1945. It should be noted that Hungary is a country was never condemned at the Nuremberg trials. The court found certain representatives of the Hungarian army guilty, but not the entire country. Therefore, the collaboration with the Nazis was quickly forgotten, and the country became pro-Soviet. As one of the countries in the Soviet bloc, Hungarians were bound to face collectivization, forced and harmful economic policies of the time. Excessive industrialization, repression and other perks of the communist regime. The Soviets even prepared the own pocket leader for them. Yes, Viktor Orban is not the first country leader that Moscow has promoted, but that's another story. Imre Negi is one of the most complex figures in the history of modern Hungary. A hero, a traitor, an enemy, and again, a hero. Imre was born into a poor Hungarian family, the son of a clerk and a domestic worker. He studied at a higher commercial school and joined the Austro-Hungarian army in 1896. In 1916, during the Brusilov offensive, he was wounded and captured by the Russians. With the arrival of the Reds in Irkutsk, Negi became active and joined the Hungarian Red Guard unit, serving in the special department of the Irkutsk Chika. In these years, due to a shortage of skilled personal internationalist, fighters were considered reliable comrades ready to carry out any order. The Russians called Imre Negi Volodya. This became his codename. In 1921, Moscow sent Negi Volodya to work underground in Hungary. Archive materials contain documents that indicate Negi's persistent attempts to secure a position as a staff member of the GPU. Instead of being appointed to a position, Negi was offered to become an unofficial agent, a secret informant, to which he agreed on January 17, 1933. There are numerous materials about his work on the intelligence agencies. Volodya's activities led to the arrest of the number of Communist Party figures in Hungary. Some of them were executed and another were sentenced to various terms of imprisonment and exile. Moreover, the documents uh, explicitly state that Volodya showed a great interest and initiative in his work and he was a qualified agent. In 1944, Imre became a member of the Hungarian government, which he later led in 1953. During his years in power, Imre Negi repeatedly opposed radical Soviet methods such as collectivization and artificial economic leveling of the population. But each time, the communists forgave Negi for his dissent, and he found himself back at the helm of Hungary. That is why, when the first protests against the communist regime began, Russia couldn't imagine that Imre Negi would stand on the side of a free Hungary. Imre Negi had been an agent of influence for the Russian Communist Party for 40 years, causing the deaths of hundreds of anti-communist activists. Suddenly, he sided with Hungary. 
nor the Soviet Union. The uprising started against the backdrop of the condemnation of Stalin's crimes at the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and peaceful protests in the center of Budapest. The demands were not overly strict. The Hungarians wanted a relaxation of the regime within the framework of the existing socialist democratic course of the Communist Party. In other words, their goal was not overthrow communism or transaction to democracy, but rather to have a slightly lighter communist yoke. However, the Soviet authorities ignored those demands and responded in their usual manner, with a brutal terror. The first days in Budapest were peaceful, which instilled hope in the city's inhabitants that peaceful demonstrations were effective. However, the Soviet forces were concentrated on the borders rather than in the capital, and it took them a couple of days to reach Budapest. The confrontation between the military and the people began. Civilians were killed on the streets, and unarmed protesters were attacked by security forces. Ukrainians who experienced two Maidans know what does it mean. Surprisingly, the demonstrators did not disperse, and the army, which included many Hungarians, sided with the people. They continued their resistance together. Feeling empowered, the Hungarians decided to go all the way to overthrow the communist regime and liberate Hungary. Unexpectedly, Imran Negi, their pocket leader, also stood up for Hungarians' freedom. Apparently, homeland proved to be more important than Russian propaganda to him. Imre put forth several demands to Russia, including multipartism. This particular demand became decisive. The Russians would not even entertain the thought of political competition. Competition gives birth to democracy and freedom. The symbol of the uprising became the Hungarian flag with the cut-off Soviet emblem. The flag with a round hole in the middle can still be seen in Hungary. Hungarians began hanging communists on trees right in front of the Soviet embassy. Russia deemed the events in Hungary as a priority and responded with a brutal terror by sending troops into the country. Imre Negi pleaded for help from the West, but the UN and NATO remained silent. There is an objective explanation for this. The world was focused on the Suez crisis. On one side was Egypt, on the other was Israel, France and Great Britain. Everyone was focused on resolving this issue, and the world stood on the brink of new war. No one wanted participating in another confrontation, especially with Russia. It was too dangerous. Thus, Russia felt invincible, and Hungary felt abandoned by the world. Both countries would remember this for a long time. Within a few days, the Soviet finally crushed the Hungarian uprising, executed the leaders of the revolution, including Imre Nagy, and unleashed a wave of bloody purges and repression throughout the country. Janusz Kadar a devoted communist loyal to the ideals of the Soviets and personally to Brezhnev, is appointed as the leader of Hungary. Janos, a figure with a controversial history, grew up in Budapest in the 1920s as the only child of a poor servant. His childhood was marked by poverty, while he displayed remarkable academic abilities. From a young age, he had to work hard to survive. In November 1931, he was one of the so-called 500 brave members of the illegal Stalinist Communist Party, which operated in defiance of the laws of the Kingdom of Hungary. His membership in the Communist Party had consequences for Kader. 
He was detained multiple times by the authorities on charges of illegal agitation and underground political activities. In 1933, as the secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Youth League, Kader was arrested and sentenced to two years of imprisonment. In 1942, he was included in the Central Committee, and in 1943, he was elected as the secretary of the Central Committee of the Hungarian Communist Party. Communist propaganda began portraying Kader as a distinguished fighter against Nazism. The USSR joined in the rather comical campaign and awarded him the title of Hero of Soviet Union, along with the Order of Lenin and the Golden Star Medal, for his personal contribution to the fight against fascism during World War II. After the occupation of the Hungary by Soviet forces, Kader, an NKVD agent, was elected as a deputy of the Temporary National Assembly and became a member of the Politburo of the Hungarian Communist Party, HCP. In 1946, he became the Deputy General Secretary of the Central Committee of the HCP. During this time, Kader wholeheartedly supported the Stalinist model of the state. He actively collaborated with trade unions and became one of the most popular Hungarian politicians, a member of Imre Negi's government, whom he later handed over for execution. Initially, he fully supported Negi's political course aimed at liberalizing the occupation regime, releasing political prisoners, lifting censorship and involving friendly non-communist political parties in state administration. In the face of the looming threat of Soviet military intervention, following Negi's declaration of Hungary's desire to withdraw from the Warsaw Pact, Janos Kader even stated that he would lie under the first Russian tank that crossed the Hungarian border. However, the bloody clashes in central Budapest, the execution of pro-Moscow security officials, and the threat of victory for the Patriots pushed Kader to cooperate with the interveners. Therefore, on November 1, 1956, Kader and parents Manich fled Hungary through Soviet residence, and by November 2, 1956, Moscow already considered Kader as a candidate for the new dictator of Hungary. On the November 4, 1956, in Uzhgorod, Ukraine, Kader met with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, who instructed him to form a puppet government. On November 7, 1956, Kader was brought to Budapest in Soviet tanks, and the next day he announced that the suppression and usurpation of power by so-called revolutionary workers and peasants government. Kader, having taken the positions of Prime Minister and leader of the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party, which was formed instead of the former uh, HWPP, declared a 15-point program. It included maintaining Hungary's dependence on Communist Moscow, an ultimatum for the resistance forces to surrender their weapons, improving the standard of living for the population, revising the absurd five-year plan and fighting bureaucracy. Most importantly, he agreed to the deployment for a Soviet occupation corps of 200,000 soldiers in Hungary. Kadar also made his famous quip, whoever is not against us is with us, which meant amnesty for passive participants in the uprising. However, it was not honored Furthermore, when Imre Negi and members of his government dared to leave the territory of the Yugoslav embassy, they were arrested and executed. From 1973, the USSR essentially provided energy resources at a nominal price, buying the loyalty of Hungary. Thanks to Kadar, Hungary was called the happiest barrack in the communist camp, and the economic system in the country was referred to as a goulash communism. Today, a significant part of Hungarian society seems to long for the times of Kader, when prosperity was achieved at the cost of limited sovereignty and cheap Moscow gas. 
Kader was removed from his positions in May 1988. He passed away a year later, on July 6, 1989. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Hungary began its own path. However, Russia didn't rid itself of its ambitions. They still want to have their people everywhere possible. They need levers of influence over the governments of countries, especially those in the former socialist bloc. Viktor Orban, as a right-wing politician, found common ground with the Russians. Why Orban? In the late 1990s and early 2000s, Europe was actively developing and several countries, including Hungary, became members of the NATO and the European Union. Against the backdrop of the European Union accession, the economic climate in the country improved, primarily due to assistance from Brussels. But during this period, a young and promising politician, Viktor Orban, was in power so, for many voters, he became the embodiment of prosperity. Over time, the politician consolidated not only the parliament as the leader of the largest party and the government as its head, but also the press. He learned the lesson from the Russians. If you want power, do not allow multi-party systems and pluralism of opinions. Everything must be in your hands. International observers were concerned about the disregard for certain procedures and the lack of equal opportunities for opposition parties in elections. The information space was dominated by Orban's party. But apparently, Mr. Orban learned well from the history that international concerns can be disregarded. Why Russia? Why did Orban choose Russia as an ally for his country? And why did the Hungarians allow it? Did they forget all the crimes of the Soviet era? There are several answers to this complex question. Once upon a time, Orban lost an election and lost his unlimited power. Historians and international relations experts believe that this was a turning point in Hungary's history in general, and specifically for Orban. Feeling the bitterness of losing power, he realized he would do anything to regain and maintain it. And who knows better how to hold on to power despite loss and international disapproval? Putin. Their friendship has another explanation – right-wing ideology. Both politicians are inclined towards ultra-right Christian ideas, calling themselves defenders of faith and promoting family values that stand in opposition to European human rights. Orban received significant support in elections simply by making anti-immigrant appeals. By playing on the fears of voters, politicians present themselves as heroes for their own people. Their propaganda machines first create terrifying monsters that need to be fought. Immigrants, gays, people of different religions, and so on. And then they successfully defeat a non-existent enemy. One of Orban's chosen enemies is Ukraine. Allegedly due to the suppression of the rights of Hungarians as a national minority, Hungary began making such claims precisely from 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea and some territories in eastern Ukraine. Statements about the suppression of the rights of Hungarians are always very emotional, absolutely vague and extremely ambiguous. It's not clear what specific rights Mr. Orban and his government are referring to, which Hungarians are suffering and what needs to be improved. It's worth nothing that the rights of Hungarians in the other countries, such as Russia itself, have never interested Orban. However, after those statements, there is always a request for autonomy, again without specifics. 
because statements about autonomy usually have a taste of separatism and encroachment on foreign territories. And Orban is afraid to speak directly about it. He is waiting to see what happens with Putin, and then perhaps he will try himself. The propaganda of Orban and the propaganda of Putin are two pillars on which those states rely. The question is whether politicians control this propaganda or they themselves have believed in it and become its hostages. However, propaganda only works where it is broadcasted. The rest of the world is indifferent to the myth created and believed by the Hungarians. That is why Mr. Orban doesn't receive support from the collective West. And with each eccentric statement, he receives less and less support. What was left to do? To align more strongly with Russia? While using media as a control to portray the nuclear power with the second largest army in the world as our friendly partners? Of course, it's not just about propaganda and the belief of Orban's voters. Money is also a factor. The European Union, which is experiencing record high prices for electricity and natural gas, presented a plan that encourages bloc members to reduce reliance on Russia's energy. However, Hungary, which is heavily dependent on Russian gas imports, obtained it an exception, allowing them to maintain a high level of imports. Furthermore, they planned to expand the nuclear power plant in cooperation with the Russian company Rosatom. The project is estimated to cost around 13 billion. If the project is realized, it will provide Hungary with thousands of jobs and greater energy independence compared to the European Union countries. That is why, despite the risk of becoming a European outcast, Hungary supports Russia. Orban is well educated. He knows that the world once betrayed his country. So why should he listen to them now? Russia, on the other hand, remembers how it is to deploy tanks onto foreign soil without consequences and the sacrament international sanctions. Recent events in Ukraine have fundamentally changed the world's perception of Russia, its power and invincibility of its army. Many Hungarians have also witnessed this firsthand. Friendship with Russia can turn into a catastrophe. However, for Orban himself, either the stakes are too high or his unwavering faith in his beliefs is too strong. He continues on his path, supporting the political and economic exile Putin and his army, essentially justifying the crimes against humanity. How far is he willing to go? Finally, let's talk about the good. No matter how unwavering Orban's course may seem, no matter how outrageous his statements may be, he has never openly justified either his attack on Ukraine or the killing of innocent civilians. His statements about the Hungarian minority in Ukraine, about historical Hungarian cities on Ukrainian territory, are always back unofficial conversation that resemble personal opinions expressed by an individual. Because despite Orban's obvious desire to remain the unchanging leader of Hungary, he will never allow the country to leave the Eurozone or even more so, NATO. He clearly understands that it's not a propaganda. Loud empty statements or playing with Russians that ensure the country money and security but rather the European Union and NATO.